This is a Rook Media Series, The Contemporary History of Iran, Part 19. Hi there, and welcome to the Contemporary History of Iran, a series from Rook Media. This is part 19, The Evolution of Persian Music. I'm Gian Gomeshi. Our aim with this series is to explore the events, personalities, and issues that have shaped modern Iran. We want to do this as much as possible through a non-traditional lens, through snapshots of change, and using alternative voices or angles. This series is mostly in English and will feature a new episode posted every Thursday across our Rook Media platforms. We will post subtitled excerpts with Farsi Zirnavis on our YouTube and Instagram sites. We are coming to you on rookmedia.com. It is there that you can link to all of our platforms, and we invite you to check out parts 1 through 18 of this series that are already posted. To become a sponsor or patron of Rook Media, please contact us through our website. The Contemporary History of Iran is brought to you in part by Yazdani Law Group. YLG is one of the largest Iranian-Canadian immigration law firms. Their mission, rooted in the leadership of founder Afshin Yazdani, is built on continuously striving to innovate and introduce new immigration pathways for their clients. Afshin began his career as a lawyer and law professor in Iran, and his company has now made it their goal to provide the best, simplest, least risky, and most inexpensive way to immigrate to Canada. YLG has an impressive track record, hundreds of applications from Iran successfully processed every year. They are at YLGPC on Instagram. That is Yazdani Law Group. All right, let's get started. Here now is the Contemporary History of Iran, Part 19. Well, we have at Rook Media placed some focus of our previous episodes on the dysfunctional nature of the Persian music industry and of Persian culture in the last 40 years or so. And we've discussed the nature of popular and classical music in modern Iran and its zenith in terms of growth and acclaim in the 1960s and 70s. But what was Persian music before the 20th century? How do we assess the development of sound and musical traditions in Iran during the Safavid and Qajar eras? Important influences that may be heard all the way to today. In short, what if we take a look at the evolution of Persian music? Well, our featured guest today is well-placed to attack this subject with aplomb. In fact, she's recently published a most interesting book about musical evolution in Iran that is not focused on deconstructing modes and melodic structures, but at the social context and elements of sound that have given rise to Persian musical traditions. Dr. Margaret Caton is an American musician, ethnomusicologist, author, editor, and clinical psychologist. She traveled to and lived in Iran before the 1979 revolution. Her area of research has predominantly been Persian classical music, musical structure, melodic contour, the lives of specific musicians and their contributions, performance context, and the relationship between poetry and music in the Persian tradition. Dr. Caton obtained her master's master's degree and her doctorate in music from the University of California. She wrote her master's thesis on the music of a Camonche performer from the province of Gilan and her doctoral dissertation on a Persian classical song form, Tasnif, 
She has taught music courses in a number of colleges and universities and written numerous articles about Persian music, published in journals such as Encyclopedia Ironica and the Garland Encyclopedia of World Music. Most germane to today's episode of the Contemporary History of Iran, her latest book is entitled A Persian Ode, Musical Life in Safavid and Qajar, Iran. And right now, Dr. Margaret Peggy Caton joins me from Los Angeles today. Hello. Hello, Jian. Nice to be here. Very nice to have you on the program. And as I say, what an interesting book you've written. Um, let's just get a little background on you. You did an ethnomusicology PhD in the 70s, and you were an American kid who ended up living in Iran for a number of years. What drew you to Iran and Persian music and history? Basically was the sound itself. And it was something that I heard the Santor being played once, and the sound was so captivating, I never forgot it. And I wanted to go into the field of ethnomusicology. When I came to UCLA, there was already a Persian musician teaching a class on Persian music. So I was able to learn the Santor. And he kept trying to convince me to major in Persian music, but I said, no, 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 I need to go to Africa. I need to go to someplace else. But there was every sign was leading me towards Persia. And I would say the sound had in it the quality that I, I felt while I was in Iran. I could feel it in the air. Hmm. I mean, this is not very scholarly of me to say. Uh, I mean, could feel it when I was riding in the buses, the Iran Pema buses, with their terribly loud popular music from certain genres that was just overwhelming. And I would just look out the window at the steps between Tehran and Esfahan, or Esfahan and Shiraz, and I could feel the same thing I felt when I heard the Santur being played for the first time. Mm. It wasn't even Persian music, it was the sound itself. It beckoned me to another world. You know, that answer makes a lot of sense, that it wasn't necessarily Persian music, it was sound itself, because the book you've written is so interesting. I mean, you uh, you draw a distinction between assessing the history of Persian music from a sort of a technical or even creative perspective, and you look at music in the context of broader society, a living tradition. Why do you, or why did you, in the course of writing this book, think it's important to see the role of music in Iran through the Safavid and Qajar eras as part of a broader social, political, economic, cultural context? <laughs> I'm, I'm laughing because I had no such thought in my mind when I was doing this. I was in the Kitab Khone Meli, the National Library, and they had a huge archive of travelers' narratives. And in the context of doing research on Tasnif, that song form, I thought, well, why don't I see if I can find out more in these travelers' narratives? So I started flipping through the books, no indexes on these books. So page by page, taking notes and so on, and what I found was so much more than what I was looking for. I didn't find what I was looking for, by the way. I just found more. What I found was the living tradition itself, the way it was before, a, life, a style of life that I was not aware of studying Persian music that was not accessible to me. There was nothing in any books, any musicological books, any history of music books that would show me how it actually was in daily life. And the way these travelers would write about the about these experiences might not have been written by an Iranian. It might have been so ordinary, so every day, they wouldn't notice it. I was going to ask you, I was going to ask you why... You would, I mean, it is fascinating reading the observations of European travelers from the 1600s, 1700s, British noblemen, French aristocrats, et cetera, the 1800s into the, the early 20th century. Um, 
it's fascinating to read their observations and to glean, get a glimpse into what um, these sounds, the oral landscape of that period in Iran was. But I wanted to know why you why you wanted to focus on them in the sense that um, I can imagine there would be people who would, um, in a knee jerk reaction, say you should be going to Persians to tell the story of Persian sound and music. Why would you go to Europeans? Um, so tease that out for me a bit more. Why did you find what the, the European travelers had to say so interesting? I had spent time, you know, with Persian musicians and studying Persian music, and I never heard anything about these traditions from them. I mean, I'm talking about the first time that I really was transported by what these Europeans were saying is when one person was accompanied by two to they were on horseback they were in the countryside going someplace and his guides were singing a local folk song something like that and the way he described it was so vivid that i felt that i was actually there mm. and that's the difference between sort of the scholarly approach that i was trained in and knew so well and this this is a non-scholarly approach these Travelers were just saying, well, look at this, you know, um, maybe an Iranian wouldn't have said, look at this, right, you know, right. okay, yeah, that they're just singing, whatever, you know, just every day. It's just an everyday thing. It's like fish don't know they're in water or something like that. I love that so much because um, I, I often believe, for example, you don't see the city you live in. Um, the way uh, somebody else would until you have a friend visit from out of town and you suddenly see it through their eyes or in your own house. You know, they, they come over and they kind of go, oh, this is what my house looks like because you're thinking about them. I, I, I really appreciate what you're saying about that. So yeah. let, let me get into some of these observations. And I thought we would do this again. Um, I don't have you for, unfortunately, for uh, 100 episodes. We, there's only so much we can do in terms of a, a comprehensive history of Persian music of the, of the last 500 years in an hour. But I thought we would take some moments from your book that I could ask you about because um, the observations and the delineations of sound uh, over this period are so interesting to me. So one of the things that you chronicle about the Europeans visiting Iran is it's actually the opening or the second chapter of your book. And you talk about, say, back to the Shah Abbas era and up to the early 20th century, visitors would often cite the image of the Persian garden and the concept of paradise accompanied by the sound of a nightingale. And nightingales are really important here. You spend some time talking about that in the book. Can you can you tell us what what you learned from these observations about nightingales? The nightingales were interesting to me because I had been told a number of times by Persian musicians that Persian music comes from the nightingale, the sound of the nightingale. And I had just sort of let it pass me by because I thought it was metaphorical or just symbolic of some sort. But then the, these visitors were talking, were noticing the nightingales everywhere. And then it seemed to me, it came to me that these musicians were talking about the sound came from the nightingale. They were not just being metaphorical. They literally were saying it came from the sound of the nightingales. And so many th things that the musicians were telling me about nightingales and about Persian music and Persians and nightingales were actually true about the nightingales. For example, a Persian musician would say, you know, the nightingale cannot sing in a cage. They are like Persians, <laughs> uh, free. They are free. They cannot be caged. Well, then I look it up and it, it seems that that was actually true. Wow that not necessarily that they couldn't sing in caves because they were captive, but they would actually commit suicide in these cages when their migration season came because they were trying to migrate. So they would throw themselves against the cages and die. 
Hmm. I believe now the nightingales are the source of Persian music. It's so interesting. It's not even metaphorical. I mean, let me. I want to quote you from uh, one this part of your book where you say, uh, this is quoting uh, your writing, in particular, the Persian classical music master used the symbol of the singing of the nightingale to convey the ideal of variation and creativity in Persian music <laughs> as opposed to precise repetition. Caron and Safavte uh, noted an instance of a formal connection between the sound of the nightingale and Persian vocal music in that one of the types of vo- vocal ornamentation, the tahrir, is named after the warbling of the nightingale, namely the tahrir bolboli. Uh-huh. So is this to say that there is a tradition of Persian music and singing that is essentially imitating the nightingale? One could say that. Somebody might argue, but informally they call tahrir itself, that uh, glottal stop ornamentation style, as cha-cha. I mean, cha-cha meaning the sound of the bird singing. You move from nightingales to talking about camels. <laughs> I mean, you know, this is a book of, of Europeans who are journeying in, in Iran. And in the 19th century, you talk about Persian caravans and the music of caravan bells. Can you describe the sound and the sound splendor of caravans and camels when it comes to these bells? I'm not sure that the camel bells were so splendor filled. (laughs) They were, one European described it as the sound of dong, 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 (laughs) dong. So, uh, <laughs> how they, dare they? <laughs> <laughs> well, they they were all in this one caravan. The bells were all the same size. Uh-huh, okay. So you didn't get ding dong. You you got. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're the one who put it in your book as an example of the evolution of Persian music. So tell me okay. about. Okay. Yeah. All right. These camel bells had a function. They had, they they actually regulated this the camel's movement and calmed them down. And they also alerted other caravans that this caravan was coming close to them. So it had that signaling function. Now there were other aspects of caravan travel with music that were also functional. The um, camel drivers, the muleteers, or there were camels, mules, horses, they would sing certain songs when they were coming near a particular manzel, which was a a way station or a town. And the camels would start speeding up because they knew Mm. that this was a signal that they were coming to a watering hole. And also the the muleteers, the, the camel drivers also sang different songs, which also had a regulating effect and calming effect on the camels. In addition, of course, I mentioned that there are so many different sounds in the camel caravan itself. The travelers had brought all sorts of live animals and all of their cookery because many of the travelers were described they would have a meal in a campground or a way station that was just as elaborate as they would have had at somebody's house. Mm. So all of this was brought with them. So there's baby crying, um, chickens screeching, dogs barking, all of that was going on. And they would go through places, of course, where there were frogs and nightingales and larks singing and other caravans. And there were there many caravans had pilgrims in them. There were pilgrimage caravans and, and the mullahs would be chanting and the pilgrims would be singing. So you would hear all of this going on. In addition to which people in the caravan themselves brought their own music. Plus, of course, when they would get to the caravanserai, there were professional musicians who came into the caravanserais and performed. But the the natural sound of the caravan, as you're describing it as this like touring musical cacophony <laughs> that uh, that you hear coming. And uh, uh, for, first of all, let me let me quote from your book. This is the American painter Edwin Lord Weeks, who was making a journey through. Persia in the late Qajar era, and you talk about, you quote him talking about the horses he encountered on these caravans. 
quote, around their necks among the many hued tassels or from their sides are hung bells and bells within bells. Our march through Persia was attended by their monotonous but not discordant music. What, what does that mean, not discordant music? The image that comes to me is a time in which I was in uh, Einsiedeln in Switzerland. It's a small town, um, very famous for the Church of the Black Madonna, and they had cows all over the countryside, very near to where, where everyone was. And these cows had different bells around their necks, and they were different uh, tones, tone quality, and they would be sounding off at all times of, of the day. And even though it wasn't music in the sense that we think of organized music, it created a sort of altered reality in that it created this feeling that we were in a magical place. Mm. Is the idea, not to be cynical here this early in the interview, but is the idea that we should see that traveling caravan sound as as music in and of itself? Or is the idea that you can actually somehow draw a line from um, the, 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 the bells, the horse bells and the camel bells and the, and the caravan um, sounds to influence Persian music as we know it itself? Oh, that's a very interesting question, actually. And this is something that has to do with how the Europeans saw Persian music, too. Hmm. The Europeans were looking at Persian music in comparison to European Western harmony and um, instruments and forms and melody and everything, but mainly the harmony was different. Persian music harmony is not this homophony that, I hate to use a scholarly word there, okay. but yeah. homophony that is, you know, tenor, soprano, bass, all at the same time, different tones, is called heterophony. And it's, it's a sort of an alternating unison that is, let's say you have a singer singing a song. This is in the classical tradition I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. but, but the person singing a song and the instrument, let's say it's a tamanche, is following that singer. And the singer is somewhat improvising, of course, the soloist. And so the instrument follows legs just a little bit behind the singer because he's not going to know what the singer is going to be right, singing right. exactly. Right. So you create this sort of a stigmatic kind of musical harmony in that it's sort of w two voices weaving around each other. Makes no sense in the Western tradition, uh, as far as I know. I don't know. I mean, we know the term heterophony now. Uh, the <laughs> people that traveled there didn't know it. All they would say is that they would call it cacophony. <laughs> Right, right, right. In, in other words, Europe, I mean, we'll get to this later in terms of the European or the Western impressions of um, and Persian music. And, and f frankly, as a as a musician who, who grew up in the West, I still listen to some Persian music and I ask my Persian friends to try and ex explain to me what's going on because sometimes it, I can't, even classical music being played by an orchestra, you know, that's very formal. I, I, can't, I can't figure it out what, what, what exactly is happening. But it was, a, it was an interesting experience answer to the question because you didn't totally answer i mean are are you suggesting that there i mean i guess you are suggesting that there is a line to be drawn from um the musical let's call it um um adventure of the caravan uh to to the traditions of persian music i didn't think of it until you asked me that question mm. and then that's the answer that came to me mm. that i can see that there could be a correlation between the two. And I wanted to add something else is we also hear, I mean, as I was raised in the West, make our own definitions of what we consider music. <laughs> Why would camel bells not be considered music? It's it's like with the, the re religious tradition, which is chanting of the Quran. Yes. But the call to prayer yes. is defined as garo'at, is defined as recitation or reading. Yes. But it actually uses the same melody, modal structure, 
as classical Persian music tradition. It's more simplified. It doesn't use as much ornaments because ornaments are associated with um, tarab, which is getting the person overly excited. But, but which one came first? I mean, I'm glad you brought, yeah, because I was going to ask you about that. I mean, this musical element that often gets talked about in your book through the Safavid and Qajar eras is the morning musical cry from the Mu'azen, uh, the prayer call, uh, the prayer cry. H- how important have these call to prayers been in the development of Persian classical or even contemporary music? Or are they following in the tradition of some kind of music that existed before that? Oh, they, they are intimately involved in the formation of the classical music tradition, as is folk music as is, I believe, everything else that was described in that book. The chanting of the Quran is considered the musical ideal in the culture for from long time back. Mm. And anything that is close to that, such as um, Sufi music in the Sama, is, and with spiritual poetry from Hafez and Rumi and Sadi mm-hmm. and so on, is considered close to that tradition. It, there's a whole hierarchy of what is the ideal. The ideal is Quranic chanting, but it's not called music. Music is associated with musical instruments mm. and with tarab, which is different than hall. Here I go with all the terminology. <laughs> You've heard of the term hall, right? Yes, yes. Which is almost, almost you cannot describe it. It's more like a communion with the divine. Mm. Tarab is not, yeah, Tarab is not associated with music of the divine. It's associated with sensual music and sensual excitement. Um, I, I want to come back to religion, but but I, when just because we were talking about these traveling caravans and, and traveling European aristocrats uh, who would have these Persians escorting them, uh, and then they would arrive at these houses for the evening or these places that would welcome them, uh, and there seems to be the equivalent of a kind of, I guess in the West we call it folk music being played on instruments that uh, you know inevitably are variations of guitar and flute and along with recitations of Persian poetry. Uh, what can you tell us about that tradition that would happen, that would be occurring in the homes through the 17th, 18th, 19th century? There's what is called tribal music. I mean, these are artificial definitions, which were not using guitar-like instruments. I mean, actually, the word tar is more original than guitar. Mm. Tar is a term for string. It came from Central Asia. So they played tar. So really, the guitar is a derivative of tar, if I could be so bold as to say that. So tar and kamanche and may, which are what they call flute and guitar and drum and so on, are more associated with the cities and the towns and that kind of tradition in urban or popular music. The folk music or tribal music or, or both have pretty different instruments, although they still have types of flute, they are a different type of flute. It depends on what was available. You go to a village or to a tribal scenario and you're going to have the local, like they say, zirna, for example. Zirna is a a double reed instrument and that instrument is often played in the rural areas. You'll have large bass drums and also you'll still have the tambourine type instruments. And the Zerna is very useful in rural settings because you can hear the Zerna for miles away in any direction. If they see a wedding procession, they would often have those kind of instruments. If they're invited into somebody's house, depends on the situation and how much money they can afford, whether they can hire professional musicians. We might call it folk music because it was in a village. But if there are roaming professional entertainers, there are often Jewish groups that did um, this Mm -hmm. kind of roving Mm -hmm. entertainment. 
and they might have the instruments that are more associated with the city. Is it fair to say, I mean, you, you spent some chapters on the book talking about the different sort of local and tribal and I guess ethnic maybe cultures around music that the Kurdish entertainers especially resonant with group dancing and feats by dervishes and the use of tambourines local chanting and singing in the Luri cultures that the music and dancing of the Baluchis is it fair to say each tribe in Iran had its own local musical styles played on basic instruments kamonche tambourine etc that would be fair to say I mean certainly that they, they could be influencing other groups as well. It's not just it's not just that there was a particular style of a particular group, but there's like interactions mm. between groups. So in something like this traveler's narrative sort of basis, there's no real discussion or talking about that. They don't really the travelers would go and they would just say what they saw in a particular area. You still have the commonalities of Islamic culture and chanting that is common using using that kind of text. I see. So, so the the commonality between uh, the the tribal the different sounds is is religious based. I I wouldn't say that. I would say that there is commonality, but it's it's more like how you'd say there would be a common language, let's say you have a common language like Persian as a common language in certain areas, but then in smaller villages you have dialects of that. Mm. So you go to Gilan, for example, and the, the Gilaki dialect might be a variation of Persian. Right, right. In right. other areas, the, it might be a separate language altogether. You know, one of the um, sections that really spoke to me, or I found really interesting, was um, when you're as you as you as you're exploring the European exploration of the different sounds that were emanating from Iran and the music um, through the Safavid and the Qajar era, is when you describe work music. Oh, yeah. Um, and, and it's so it's so clear how important music is to Persians, um, as there are songs. Uh, that are sung, uh, different ones, in each working pr profession. The bricklayers have these chants and songs. The caravan workers, the masons, uh, they each have this singing tradition. The carpet weavers have their chant. The Persian boatmen have their mournful chants. It, it reminded me again, in in perhaps a, a naive way, because I don't, I don't know more the traditions like this that that occurred in Iran. But it reminded me of, you know, the traditions of say African American culture of working yeah. in the South, you know, and having on the chain gang the songs and the or in the the plantations or say, you know, et cetera. It, is this something we would find in any country or culture, or is this somehow more pronounced in Iranian society that each of these worker groups would have these songs and chants? For certain kinds of work, this was could be found anywhere. I haven't studied the whole world. I just found these in mentioned by these travelers. They didn't mention everything. There's a whole genre of street vendor songs that were very elaborate. When I was in Iran, the nafti would come, the oil seller, and he would have a very repetitive type of song or chant, you know, and we would know that the nafti was there and we would go out and get the oil. But in the past, the street vendor songs would be very elaborate. It was a whole musical tradition which did not get covered by the travelers. Apparently they did not notice it or maybe they didn't know what it meant. But it, it does come back to the question of what we consider to be music. I mean, for example, you talk about the drumming tradition that evolves out of Zur Khunez or Houses of Strength. Uh, and these drums that are being played while men are working out with these big clubs. Um, is that music? Do we consider that music? Of course, that's music and anybody's definition of music, because it goes along with the recitation of the Shahnameh, the Book of Kings. There's someone who is singing and playing the drum. But again, we get it back to the issue of music and its role or how it was viewed in Iranian culture. And 
it was supposedly circumstruct, circumscribed, banned in certain instruments. Mm -hmm. Although banning in one context, this seemed to occur during the Safavid area in particular, it's like Shah Tamas. He would have music in the courts and ban it for everybody else. Yeah, the, I, let me get to that, the contradictions of that. I was going to say that there's a lot of uh, music certainly follows ceremony in a lot of ways in Iran. And, and oh, yeah. you, you talk about weddings. I mean, we think of Persian weddings today as big blowouts with uh, loud music and dancing and six, eight DJs, you know, uh, shisha hash. But, but I mean, it's this, this is clearly not a new tradition. And even in the tribal weddings of the, the 19th century, 18th century, you're talking about loud dancing and singing and bagpipes and, and tambourines. But you also talk about music being used in sort of more darker or even macabre kind of scenarios. You talk about the presence of music at punishment, torture, and execution rituals. Um, I didn't want to leave that out. I didn't want to censor it. it. I wanted to. I wanted everything. Well, what was the role of music in these kind of events? Well, the music stirred people up. There were two types, basically two types of musical groups. One was the ceremonial military group, and the other was this majlisi or entertainment or you know chamber music type groups and what they used for the um the tortures the executions and so on was the military style music because it featured these horn these long loud horns big big drums kettle drums different kinds of drums and in the older times the zerna also and these these had a very, very stirring and exciting effect. They were used in war to signal, to excite the soldiers and to scare the enemies. It simply stirred people up. Mm. And in later years, towards the end of the Gajar era, it was mainly Western musical groups mm. that were the instruments that were being used. Tell me about this delicate dance. We've we've mentioned it briefly a couple of times in this chat, but this delicate dance of religion and music in Persian tradition, it seems it's obviously particularly fraught. I mean, on the one hand, and I know I'm saying this in a very simple way, there's a strand of Islamic interpretation that prohibits any kind of music. On the other, there's all kinds of ways in which music and religion are coexisting through this period. For example, you say, uh, let me quote you, a workaround to the issue of music prohibition was the use of differentiating terminology and the categorization of certain types of sound experiences as chant or recitation rather than music per se. Uh, yes. whether, whether this was an intrinsic categorization of a difference in style or a way of distinguishing different types of sound for religious purposes. So what is this? How do we make sense of the use of music and the prohibition of music when it comes to Persian tradition and religion? It, it evolved over time. At one point, let's say, musical instruments defined something as music, so they would not have musical instruments. Then later, they would define musical instruments that are used for religious purpose. They would say, okay, um, the Nagara Khane, for example, is more okay than the Majla Si. Then the, now I'm using just Persian terms, and I shouldn't. Okay, so the, the ceremonial music with the drums and trumpets and zernas and so on are more allowable than the other, than the stringed instruments, for example, since the stringed instruments are associated with pleasure houses. Ah, entertainment. And the right. Sufi, Sufi always were on the edge. They were sort of mostly not okay, but somehow not completely not okay, because <laughs> they use spiritualized music and maybe they used flute and daff were considered more spiritual musical instruments than an instrument like the kamanche. And Sufi groups would, they use tambour, for example, which is a stringed instrument, mm -hmm. especially in Kurdistan, and that was considered a sacred instrument. So in the context of a particular Sufi following Sufi group, tambour was okay. Some Sufi groups said no music, no instruments. The, Nohe, the, the people who chanted in the streets during Moharah, 
and would beat their chest in time to the music or hit themselves with swords and chains in time to the music were using basically anthems. They were singing in unison, in a rhythmic style. It was not chanting, it was really singing songs. But because it was for religious purposes and they had musical instruments that were the military style musical instruments, then it was considered okay. It was in this sort of gray area. Like the Tazier, the Passion Plays, depicted in particular the, during the 10 days of Moharlam, all the events that led up to the execution of uh, Hossein Hassan, his family. Uh, it was depicted as theater in the round, whether it was outdoors or whether it was in a big theater like the government theater in Tehran. And the Passion Play was in the central arena with a stage, a round stage, and they would bring in horses and they would depict traveling where they actually would get on a horse and go round and around the stage. The Nagora Khane, the traditional military group, would be up in the balcony in the government theater and they would be signaling certain events. This also took place not in the Safavid era. This was not a Safavid then. This developed particularly during the time of Nasrin Shah, uh -huh. who really liked pageantry. And so things became more and more okay, little by little. I mean, this ceremonial music, especially into the Qajar era, um, plays a major role in the evolution of music culture in Iran. And, and I want to ask you about, I mean, you talk about the drums and trumpets at official events and functions, and, and there's this um, period of saluting the rising and the setting of the sun. There's a, a musical greeting for the sun each day in Esfahan. Um, what, what did you learn about that? I learned that I wish that ethnomusicologists would have studied this more. This is such a major part of the culture. It's a, it's at least as important as, as the other in the Magical Sea music. The ceremonial music I had no idea about until I started reading these travelers' narratives, and little by little it all unfolded. Mm. The Estek Ball, can you believe it? the welcoming ceremonies were so elaborate? You have it just is astonishing how elaborate they were. This is when uh, somebody visits from another out of town or something and they, they hold a big welcoming ceremony, yes? Right, so the, the foreigners would come in or king or royalty would come in and about two miles out of town, they would be greeted. The whole town would come out. In the Safavid era, men and women came out. In the Gajar era, only men came out. And the Gajar era after Fat Ali Shah, this tradition started dying out. It, it included all the ceremonial music. The, the capital city had a Nagar Khane of 50 players. Can you imagine 50 players with huge drums, zurnas, and eight foot long trumpets coming out and playing. How many miles that reaches out. The wrestlers, the jugglers, the dancing women, in the Gajar area, no dancing women, but um, every kind of entertainer, people would be throwing vases of sugar underneath the horse's feet. When Fat Ali Shah came, Morier described one of the last big guest balls. When he came into town from a military campaign, every religious group came out, the Armenians, the Jews, the, the Sufis, the Mullahs, every, and each had their own legation chanting their own songs. Everything was so elaborate and it started fading out after that. Even if somebody was bringing a letter to somebody coming in, that would have a ceremony involved with it. Uh, there was a ceremony of opening of a granat for example, uh, the the wells that were being dug. And, and we haven't even gotten to funerals, uh, which is a whole other uh, massive uh, area of ceremony that involved uh, music as well. I, I, I wanted to, I know I can't keep you forever. I wanted to-, uh, to You can if you want. 
<laughs> you'll get hungry. You'll need water. I, I don't. I don't. <laughs> uh, the by the end of the Qajar era, by the end of the 19th century, at least, we increasingly see the influence of European music. I actually was looking for this in your book. Where's the turning point where suddenly there's an infiltration of of European sounds and instruments, et cetera. And you say something really interesting, or you enlighten me very, very, very interestingly in the book by saying that the influence of European music in Iran starts to really become pronounced in the in the early 19th century and then throughout the 19th century related to military concerns and the organization and discipline of troops. Can Can you speak to that? Again, this is something I discovered in travelers narratives where this one traveler had gone to Azerbaijan and noted that the crown prince, I guess it was Abbas Mirza at the time, had, had gotten this idea, had seen the fact that the Iranian soldiers were being defeated over and over again by people from, you know, Russia, the Caucasus, and he started noticing how they were being disciplined, these, these um, European fighters who were defeating the Iranians, and they were being organized and trained in these very highly regulated manner using the European instruments, the drum and the fife, or the flute in particular, but basically, it's, in a way, it's kind of like the Zorhane, if you could relate it to that, using the drum to regulate movement. Mm -hmm. And so he started training the soldiers using a military band and using military music that was Western, that would be regulatory because it was metered, it was an even beat, and so they could march evenly. So he developed the orderliness and the military orderliness by using Western musical traditions, military music. All the ambassadors and all of the people that came in a diplomatic corps brought their own music, and they were always looking down on the Iranians' music as being more primitive and undeveloped. Mm -hmm. So there was this sort of pressure that way. And Nasruddin Shah went to Europe and other people, other Shahs went there, but Nasruddin Shah in particular went to Europe and noticed all of the Western music there and was sort of captivated and wanted to bring it back. So they music became a part of Polytechnic University. Actually, it was one of the disciplines that was taught there along with other engineering, military sciences, whatever. That's how it began. You know, the, the influence of European music in Iran and the instrumentation, I feel like inevitably comes hand in hand with almost absorbing uh, or allowing that the condescending attitude of the Europeans towards the Persian music to, to uh, become embedded in Persian thinking as well, where, you know, you start to see the musicians that are valued are the ones who can play the, the, the Western music by the time we get to the, the to, to early 20th century. You quote some European observers uh, who are very disdainful of Persian music as you chronicle what they wrote about it, say, in the 19th century. There's a, a nobleman named uh, Druville. I want to read this quote. It's, it's, it's kind of devastating, but it says, uh, quote, there is no music in Persia because I will not profane this name by giving it to barbaric sounds without cadence nor measure and which resemble more these cries of wild beasts than to harmony. Notations, however, there were known, but I believe that they are absolutely forgotten there today. And during close to three years, I never saw anybody making use of it. Um, and then there's, I, a, I mean, it's, it's just, you know, oh I, and that, yeah, it's, uh, you That's know, the, it has to be the worst quote. Well, there's another one. Oh, this is from Landor in 1902, speaking of Persian music. Persian music is inspiriting. There are certain musical notes, the vibrations of which seem to go to the heart more than others. And on these notes, the Persian musician will work his melody. Sad love songs in the falsetto voice are prevalent and are sung so high that, as with the, the beluge, it makes one really quite anxious for the safety of the singer. The notes are kept on so long and the melody repeated so often that the artery and veins in the singer's neck and temples <laughs> bulge out in a most abnormal manner. There's no actual end to a Persian melody. 
which terminates with the exhaustion of the singer or abruptly by the sign of the hearers who get tired of it. The musicians every now and then join in the chorus and repeat the refrain. I mean, these are um, pretty you know, horrible indictments of, of, of Persian music. How, I, I mean, these are also just observations. We could say, okay, these are, these people are, you know, racist or, or, or whatever. But, but I'm curious how those attitudes you believe influence the increasing uh, Europeanization of, of of Persian music culture by the end of the Qajar era, the the adoption of the piano, the the adoption of European instrumentation and classical traditions. I do not know actually the answer to that question, but let's say that you have relations with big, powerful foreign nations, they send their ambassadors, they have big shows of power and wealth and military strength. Perhaps like Abbas Mirza, people wanted to be considered as equals by these big foreign powers. I don't know. It seems reasonable to suppose that. Now, it seemed as though mechanization and size was part of the criteria for um, European visitors to compare Persian music badly, that they say they were handmade instruments versus the, you know, more polished, mm. technologically made instruments, or the size of the orchestra in Europe is a hundred performers, mm. in the size of an orchestra in Iran was three performers, and so it was like the bigger is better, mm. and one can over time, since every single Western visitor had some sort of, I say, at least patronizing attitude towards Persian music, but, but it's nonetheless what. <laughs> but it's but it's yeah. actually not that far off from the way musicians were seen by those in power inside Iran, right? I mean, you talk That's about Nasser yeah, al-Din right. Shah considering, you know, your musicians were co were considered very low status. I mean, as as kind of laborers of the the lowest order, were they not? Yes, I mean, that's the Amalaya Tarab, you know, the manual labors of Tarab, which is a forbidden sentiment anyway. Some of the itinerant performers are lutis, the people that hung out in the taverns and uh, the houses of strength and were the, the, the sort of the tough guys of the neighborhood. They were considered fit to play music. Uh, any uh, religious minority was, they were okay to play music. Armenians, Jews, uh, they could play music because they're low class anyway, according to the culture. It goes on like that. It's, of course, those days you wouldn't find people of that type of mind that actually regarded Persian music in its own right as its own meaning in its own culture mm -hmm. and as as equally as valuable as, you know not more so than European music that that simply was not the kind of thinking that people were having in those days and do you believe that's changed today I would hope that it would have changed I would at least we have a field called ethnomusicology where right. it is it's supposed to be it's sort of a doctrine of ethnomusicology to believe that way. I mean, it can't. How can it be worse? It can't be worse than than it was. <laughs> right, right. It. I mean, it's it's a bit heartbreaking to be honest. When you where where if we start from the nightingale, uh, and end with the the low status of of the of the musicians into the early twentieth century being, you know, sort of considered. Uh, um, laborers who aren't worth much, and and unless they're part of the court or royal musicians, of course. Um, oh, or, yeah. yes, I'm going to interrupt this. I just have to. Even in the field of ethnomusicology, oftentimes it is the classical music tradition that is studied. These traditions that I included in this book were studied rarely. So you have a status involved in the Radif, Daska, Makram. That was what we studied. That's what I studied. All of this other was just left out. Yeah, that's, I would say, essential. It is, it is so... 
enriching I, I've, I've found, both reading your book and talking to you. And I, I have to thank you so much for all the time you've given us. Before you stop, I, I, I did, there's one thing I've, I've got to, I think it was my teacher, Mr. Varzi, because I was at Kamache. This is a very common story where the European comes and says, uh, you know, what is Persian music compared to the grandeur of, of Western music, uh, European music with a large orchestra and big sounds? You know, it's the ocean compared to, the, to a drop that Persian music is. Mm -hmm. And so the musician answers and he says, yes, but it's a teardrop. <sighs> wow. I wanted to ask you a final question, but to, to kind of go back to where we started, and the pre Dr. Caton, the, the the Peggy Caton who was in Iran as you know in the in the nineteen seventies, um, seduced by the sounds that she heard of the Santur. And I want to know if you, through the journey of um, exploring these observations from Europeans and writing this book and getting to where you've gotten to today, if you have any more clarity around um, what the magic of that, those sounds were that so captivated you when you first heard them? I do, in a sense. And it was my final trip to Baluchistan that did it for me. I went there to get gather some music and um, uh, for various reasons. And this Iran tour guide was at the t radio TV in Zahedan and said, Oh, I've got to show you something really interesting out towards Zabol. It's, you, you've got to see it. It comes from the Book of Kings and from the Shahnameh. It's a really historic. So I went out to what is now known as Shara Sukhte, which was an archaeological site. Mm. It was out in the middle of the desert. You know, there's this dinky one lane highway to Zabul from Zahidan. We're going out there and we're walking over, it could be the plane of the moon for as far as I know. And the guide was t showing me where there used to be a riverbed. He said this was a town of 50,000 people. It was the crossroads on a trade route. There was nothing there and all of the city was buried. They had found all kinds of things already. And it was out there that I realized that it wasn't necessarily the sound of the instrument the sound of the instruments were portraying that sense that i felt in the desert hmm. of the history the ancient ancient history of iran far more ancient than anybody had realized thousands of thousands of years there was a rich culture that was considered to be a myth but it was based in fact that these people really did live and that's where they lived. And it was all covered up by, by the desert wind and sands. And that's the sense I, I could feel spirit in the air, in Iran, in the desert, in the plains of Iran. And that's what the Persian music sound portrays to me. Dr. Margaret Caton, I thank you so much for this today. Well, it was quite enjoyable. You have very interesting questions. We could continue this for quite a while. We just may have to. <laughs> thank <laughs> you, and I hope to talk to you again soon. All right. Thank you, John. Bye-bye. Bye. Dr. Margaret Caton an American musician, ethnomusicologist, author, editor, and clinical psychologist. Her latest book is entitled A Persian Ode, Musical Life in Safavid and Qajar, Iran. Dr. Margaret Caton joined us from Los Angeles today. This is full time for the Rook Media series, The Contemporary History of Iran, Part 19, brought to you with the support of Yazdani Law Group, one of Canada's largest immigration law firms, YLGPC, on Instagram. Please check out our regular editions of Rook. 
and all things related at rookmedia.com, regular editions of Rook every Monday across our platforms, and our website, rookmedia.com. Thanks to the amazing team who make Rook Media happen, talented Anahita, Super Patty Saw, Ponsa the Artist, Savi Roham, Aray Mehdad, the fabulous Keon, Captain Reza, and Groovy Shaya. Thank you to all of you out there for supporting us and sharing our content. Please subscribe if you have not done so already. Find me on Instagram at Giangomeshi. Mizunbashin. Bashin.